Uh, so, <clears throat> in uh, this video, I want to talk about uh, the author, American author Philip K. Dick, and uh, a little bit about his work, The Man in the High Castle, which has recently been turned into a, a fairly popular uh, television series. And, uh, okay, so, what is The Man in the High Castle, and uh, what do I think is significant? Well, uh, The Man in the High Castle is a 1962 uh, Hugo award-winning uh, novel by American author Philip K. Dick. And uh, Dick, prior to this point, had been a uh, mainly a pulp fiction author uh, whose work had sort of it had been flying under the, under the wire a little bit, under the radar, um, because he'd uh, he was he was still he was he had sort of outlined the themes that he was going to deal with in, in almost all of his literature but uh, hadn't quite got the method down just yet. And then he, 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 he sort of gets, he gets it with the uh, Man in High Castle and it, and it clicks. And this leads him to winning the, the Hugo Award, a prestigious uh, science fiction award. Uh, so the theme that uh, Dick is dealing with in the Man in High Castle is, of course, alternate uh, history or virtual history. And in this context, uh, Dick creates an alternate reality in which uh, sort of the the ultimate uh, alter alternative history for uh, his, uh, alternative history fans, which is where the Axis powers win uh, the Second World War, uh, the nightmare scenario uh, for the Allies, <coughs> and uh, therefore. In Philip Dick's 1962, instead of a Cold War crisis between the uh, escalating Cold War crisis between uh, the United States uh, and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies, the so-called free world and the uh, Iron Curtain bloc, we have what the story explains is in fact a conflict between the uh, or a, a, a similar style Cold War conflict between the victorious powers uh, of the Axis, uh, na namely uh, the Empire of Japan and the Third Reich of uh, Hitlerian Germany, National Socialist Germany. Now, the book itself is 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 a vehicle, mainly a vehicle for the ideas of, of Philip Dick. Of course, this is not uh, uncommon to his uh, literature. The man was a, a you know, as is very well known, is an unbelievably prolific uh, writer. Uh, some believed he, he suffered from um, like like micro strokes, which caused him to write uh, hypergamy. So he wrote incredibly prolifically, and um, the. Uh, even in, even in his early phase, he was a he was a prolific writer. So he was again he was cranking out these pulp stories, and so the, but the Man in the Castle was the first one that really ha I, caught people's attention in terms of its its gravitas, the themes that it was able to evoke and deal deal with. And the book itself is really a critique of two things. Firstly, it's a critique, and most uh, clearly, it's a critique of historicity. That is the concept of things or objects having partic particular value because of their historical uh, relevance. And I believe Dick was fascinated with this concept, and he uses a great metaphor, or there's a, there's a certain um, incident in the book where he's able to really uh, explain this, which is where he, he, he uses the case of a uh, a a um, lighter, a uh, a zippo. I think it's a zippo lighter that is happens to have been is possessed by one of the characters, and he's, he's discussing this with another one of the protagonists. The book, of course, has several protagonists, and it jumps around. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. It jumps around between characters, but the uh, in this case, uh, this lighter uh, is supposedly been in the possession of a Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It was, it was presumably one of his lighters. 
And now, naturally, only by this individual knowing that does the lighter become quite valuable and, and of historical significance. Now, if nobody were, the, the, the brilliant philosophical element here is, and uh, historiographical aspect, is that if nobody knows of the historicity of that object, then it is just an everyday lighter. And there's, there's of course, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of those produced around the world, even in the universe of the Man in the High Castle. And so it is only by this and again, in terms of the like, you know, the atomic structure of these things, there, there, there is no difference. The lighter is, it's, it's a one, one in a thousand, you know, one in ten thousand, uh, absolutely atomically identical to all of its others, and so on. It's only the knowledge that it was possessed by uh, the president of the United States that makes it uh, valuable. Now, what the other concept? that uh, Dick was really critiquing here is, uh, it is a little, little you have, it really have to get through the whole book to get to this point, but it's the, histori the concept of historicism, as it was described by the philosopher Karl Popper in the 19, uh, 1930s and 1950s. And this is the notion that the work of the sciences and the work of the social sciences is inherently meant to progress towards an a, a ability to predict the future. And uh, of course this, this is uh, Popper's famous, uh, he's well known for um, his uh, concept of his critiques of the scientific method, uh, particularly uh, <clears throat> the, the methods of acquiring evidence of which he favored uh, the ver verification, I believe it is over, I think it was induction. And in, uh, so the, the famous uh, Popperian uh, metaphor for the value of verification is this concept about uh, the rising of the sun, and in which we can never say with 100% certainty that uh, despite all mathematical, model, mathematical models and despite all the history uh, that leads us to suspect that this should, the patterns of history that the human brain is very good at analyzing, leads us to suspect that you know, the sun should rise every morning. Now, what Popper pointed out was that technically that's impossible to actually verify. It's impossible to know until it has actually happened. So you can't, there's no uh, guarantee that the sun will in fact rise uh, the next morning. And uh, only by its doing so can it then be verified and then uh, we are able to say that it has, it has, you know, the pattern has indeed been fulfilled. So this again, the notion that you can predict the future from uh, the sciences or from the more more significantly uh, the social sciences in the case of um, the history that we're describing uh, was a critique of Popper's that is embodied by uh, Phil K. Dick, in, especially in the book um, *The Man in the High Castle*. So in *The Man in the High Castle*, the axis have won the Second World War, and They've divided up, um, most of the action takes place, I think almost all of the action takes place in the continental United States. And the United States has been uh, split sort of down the middle and like the, the Pacific coast has been annexed by the Empire of Japan and the uh, I believe portions of the Atlantic are under control of um, the Third Reich. In the, the political situation in the Reich, is difficult because uh, Hitler is suspected to be dying at this point of syphilis and they're waiting for, so this is sort of the, the backdrop of the story, everyone's waiting for uh, who will succeed him and it's either going to be, um, I believe it's, it's, you know, it would be one of the main contenders, so Goebbels, Goring, or, or Himmler, and, or Bormann, and the primaries, as you will, and they're all sort of Dick was a very good, he was very good at caricaturing the struggles for power, especially at the, at the um, uh, you know, their pinnacles at the highest political levels. And he, he so there, of course, these uh, Nazi kingpins, uh, uh, bosses, are all vying for power with each other, and they're fighting with each other, and, you know, preparing to knock bump each other off, and so on. So, but everybody's waiting for Hitler to die, so that then the, the great power struggle will take place. 
And this was a this I should add this is a theme that Dick had described in a previous book, uh, which he had written actually about specifically about the Cold War. And of course, we can't we can't take this uh, book out of its historical context, which is that it's been written during the Cold War. Uh, you know. Uh, actually being published in the same year as the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis is taking place. So the backdrop to the writing of the story is the, the again, the very intense Cold War conflict between uh, Kennedy and uh, Khrushchev. But uh, in one of uh, Dick's earlier books, uh, which was called The Penultimate Truth, he described a world in which uh, the Third World War had already been fought disastrously and the survivors had split society into two groups, one of which was uh, living in these bunkers, in which they were, they were essentially told, um, they were, they're, they're tasked with manufacturing things endlessly, and they're just told, you know, you have to, um, you, you must continue to produce these products, uh, you know, so that we can continue to fight the war and so on, whereas the actual political elites, of course, are living uh, above uh, the bunkers out, out in the real world, and they're reclaiming it, and there's nobody around because everyone is, is but still believes that the war is still taking place. In the in the in the well, they live in these bunkers. But of course, it is not. And the politicos have been replaced in a classic Dickian uh, twist with um, replicants, as you might expect, or or uh, androids, uh, a you know recurring theme in in uh, Philip K. Dick's literature. So. This was another th Dick liked to discuss. He liked to he liked these themes of the the war that never ends, or the uh, very you know the the idea of the war taking place when in fact uh, it has already been resolved, and you know fighting about point sort of the the notion that your your struggle is your ideological struggle may be pointless, and saying that you should possibly you know, probably question. And he wrote he so he he was always trying to get you to do this with with uh, his literature, at least or at least some of it. Um, you know, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to question your reality. Is I think the ult, the penultimate uh, truth of the uh, Dickie and Oove, uh, you know, question, question your your surroundings, question your reality. Uh, how can you be sure, you know, that it is in fact uh, real? Especially political or or you know, uh, realities which are ideological and therefore can be created by things like propaganda or um, you know, population control, hypnosis, what have you. Uh, this is you know Orwellian. 1984 aspect to the penalty of the truth, and indeed to the Man in the High Castle. So the Man in the High Castle, uh, there's the power struggle taking place within the Nazi leadership, and uh, the Japanese are preparing their next move, which is they're going to, you know, they they're, they want to uh, move against uh, Nazi Germany naturally, and the Nazis are preparing to fight the Japanese, and so it's it's the, the again the 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 world is. Less the the world of the Man in the High Castle is less different than it would have first appear based on the radical difference of the outcome. So this is I really uh, I think this is a profound way to think about at least one way to imagine alternative histories, where even though the outcome of such a significant event as a as a war. Uh, especially a profound ideological you know, nuclear war as the Second World War, could still result in, for all intents and purposes, the same power struggles taking place. So in a sense, this is a, stru it's a very structuralist novel. So again, a kind of, there's a critique of structuralism there, where the agency of the characters is not, quite, is not nearly as significant. In fact, it's very, very true. It's not nearly as significant as the overarching structure, which is really from the, the Dickian aspect is the power structure. And so the, uh, as uh, Foucault would like to critique in his post-structural work, the uh, power structure is what's really at play here. And so whether it's, uh, again, f you know, free market capitalism and democracy versus uh, Marxist Leninist, you know, state-driven socialism, command economy, or national socialist uh, economic nationalism, and totalitarianism versus uh, Japanese fascism. Uh, you know what Dick is saying here is that you know the the, the outcome is basically it doesn't matter. <laughs> the end result is they're going to be to some extent the same in that the power structures maintain themselves. Whether you know whether the ideologies are different, these are just minor minor problems. 
And so there's, he has some nice ways of, of describing this, one of which is a, is a really quite brilliant scene, which um, it takes place later in the novel. One of the, main, one of the characters is a Japanese functionary working in, I think it's San Francisco or Seattle. And he's, uh, he's, a, he's a collector. He's a, he's a collector of American Civil War uh, you know, doodads. So pistols and uh, uniforms and pipes and things like this. This is going back to this theme of um, historicity. So, he's, he wanted, so anyway, one day he's out with a uh, particular crystal that he has. And while he's, he's sitting down and he's meditating very hard and he's really thinking, he's looking at this crystal. And as he's thinking about it, for he suddenly he goes, all right, you know, he gets up and he walks off and he goes to the, he gets out of this park and he goes into a, a bar. And when he gets into the bar, it's, things seem a little bit different. And it's, there's all these Americans there. And he's kind of like, you know, why are there so many Americans? Because they're supposed to be uh, you know, occupied by the Japanese, which the Japanese are. And uh, there's um, other things that differentiate the two worlds is, uh, for example, marijuana is legalized by the Japanese to con as a population control mechanism uh, for the Americans in the uh, Mannheim Castle world. And they, uh, they use um, uh, human-drawn carts as opposed to you know, more, like motor cars uh, as the Americans use, you no know, highways. Um, for example, in America, and so suddenly he, he steps outside of this bar, and then there's there's these massive highways. And, like, what? and then he he goes back and he sits back down. And he looks back at the crystal, and he kind of pops back out. And these this uh, Japanese functionary returns to the the so-called real world after for just for a brief moment having actually uh, transposed himself into what we suspect may have been the true reality that is you know, the timeline that we are living in, where in fact the Allies have won the war. And so, this is, a, this is a great way of showing you again uh, the, the, the perhaps perhaps the two worlds are you know they're they're very close to each other. I mean, they bump into each other once in a while, or you can maybe you can you can just slip in to one of them, and you know. So again, perhaps the you know the structural fabric of reality is not as solid as we're led to believe, according to Dick. So at any rate, the uh, this uh, the title character of the book, the man, the the man in the high castle, is a man who has written a novel, which is called. This is another one of these you know these little scenarios where where the reality seems to be poking through the holes, and this is called um, the grasshopper sleeps heavy. I believe it is, and it is a novel, an alternate history novel about where the Allies have won the war. And this novel has been written by an author who's living, um, was in Colorado, in the Manor High Castle, and he is of course up on a mansion somewhere. Else. So there's a literal aspect of this, but he's written this book where the the Allies have won the war, and it's 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 circulated surreptitiously to uh, freedom fighters and uh, partisan agents who are fighting against the fascists. And so one of, um, I believe it's a Jewish woman, uh, has heard about this and so she's, she's desperately struggling to get to the man in the castle to, to find out what the truth is and how does he know, you know, like, why, why did, you know, what, how, how is it possible that uh, he's written this book and it's, it's the book is of course banned, it's, you know, suppressed and so on. So, she finally finds him, and what he reveals to her is that how he wrote the book was by rolling, he was using the I Ching, famous uh, Chinese book of changes, uh, which is a, is a method, actually a method for predicting the future. This gets back to the critique of, or Popper's critique of historicity. So, or excuse me, historicism. So, the author of the, man, of the author of the grasshopper has been rolling. He says every sentence that he wrote, he rolled on the I Ching to determine it, and therefore the outcome of the book that he created was the result, the direct result of a thorough prognostication process that he derived from rolling on the the book of fate, the book of changes, the I Ching. And therefore, the 
truth is that the Allies must have won the war. Because had they lost, surely then he could not have predicted this uh, so, so thoroughly by rolling on the, uh, on the I Ching. And so this is again a profound revelation where they, the uh, people, everyone, you know, you should, again, the people in the novel begin to question their reality in the same way that the Japanese functionary was questioning his when he sort of, you know, momentarily blipped into uh, the real world, as it were. Now, to be sure, there are differences, as we say, in the timelines. And one of the, some of the profounder ones are, for example, that the Nazis have euthanized most of Africa as a colonization. And uh, they're also, however, they're also um, planning to colonize. They're sending out nuclear-powered spaceships, you know, to go, to go colonize the stars and so on. And um, perhaps, which, you know, not so different from what the Americans and the Soviets were doing during the space race and the Cold War. Again, some some parallels there. Uh, but ultimately, the threat of nuclear annihilation is still hanging over them because, as we saw, the uh, leadership of the Third Reich, the leadership of the fascist Japan, are preparing to struggle uh, for final supremacy in the same way as the Soviet Union and the United States. So, what Dick has done with the book is laid out in a very compelling way these four or five, you know, three or four important historiographical concepts that we should keep in mind. Uh, one, the fiction of historicity. That is to say, the objects only, we, we imbue the objects with significance by remembering their history. And that as soon, and the history is entirely remembered. It's, it's, it exists only in the minds of the rememberers, and as soon as it is forgotten, then the objects have no historicity, in which case they are identical, even though they may, in fact, have supposedly profound historical significance based on their origins. This raises, you know, so, so what is history? Is it, is it real? Is it simply a creation of, um, a, is it a mass mutual uh, hallucination, perhaps? These are great Dickian themes. I have here uh, the exegesis of Philip K. Dick, which is a uh, selection uh, written from uh, Dick's later period when he was uh, writing every night, uh, you know, like hundreds of pages about uh, his theories about the nature of the universe, the nature of reality. And so anyone who's read his Vallis uh, trilogy will, will know about uh, this as well. And so uh, he, was, he, was, he was constantly haunted by this concern about how real was his, his reality. And so the, the Man in the Night Castle is the most concrete explication of his view of history, specifically. Where, again, the, the power structures, the, the, in the Foucault sense, are, are essentially entrenched. They're structural and they maintain themselves. They, they matter more than the actual events of the, of the history itself. The outcome ends up being effectively the same. In this case, the superpowers are preparing to go to war. And it's very, and of course, in the 19, 1962, 1963, when the book is written, it's, it's believed at this time that there could very well be a, a uh, superpower nuclear uh, confrontation, which would mean, in fact, you know, uh, mutual annihilation and mass carnage. So we, replicating that between the uh, uh, Nazis and the fascist Japanese, uh, Dick is saying, you know, perhaps we should be reconsidering in our in our in our reality. We should be reconsidering uh, the possibility of you know nuclear holocaust and fighting these, this, this war between the superpowers uh, when it's just as, it's very it's, it's most likely that this would have happened had the Nazis won the war. So then, what will, you know the Axis? So what will be the point of fighting the war if the outcome is going to be the same, right? And that's the question that should 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 uh, really get you thinking if you're into into alternate history. And uh, the question of structure versus agency, E.H. Carr, uh, and the question of free will, and so on. Something to meditate upon. Uh, likewise, the critique of historicism, where, in the Popperian sense, in that, and where <clears throat> the function of all of the an analysis is being done and all the worrying about. Uh, the future is is an attempt to uh, predict predict it, and uh, Dick is saying, "Look, you don't really, you know, it's it's actually quite easy to predict, because look, all you have to do is and this is the post-structural nature of Dick's work is all you have to do is look at the 
structure, once you understand that, then the outcome matters, is very easy to predict because it's, it's quite obvious. It's in fact, sort of jokingly, 